Welcome to Kiss the Reviews. I'm Armando, that's Corey, and today we're doing, by request, 1970s Beyond the Valley of the Dolls. And if you want to follow the Roger Ebert haters, you can follow us uh, at Kiss the Reviews on Twitter, Instagram, and TikTok. And also, if you want... Um, a little insight into because we'll probably make reference to it on the show on YouTube and yada yada. Uh, but if you want any insight into the Amy Chronicles that uh, Corey is reading prior to the show starting, uh, you'll get some of that. And we're we're in the works of some other interesting little uh, little things that we can give to our Patreon subscribers. But you can follow us on Patreon. Um, and we're at Kiss the Reviews at Patreon too. So. Made it easy across the board. Yeah, nobody was not imaginative. But yeah, nobody, we made it easy. Nobody wanted that shitty name. So kiss, at Kiss the Reviews is available everywhere. <laughs> well, Riff Tracks was already taken. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Oh, darn. So let's get into the cast of 1970s Beyond the Valley of the Dolls. This film stars... Dolly Reed as Kelly McNamara, Cynthia Myers as Casey Anderson, Marsha McBroom as Petronella Danforth, and Dan Gurian as Harris, or Dollar Store 70s Paul Rudd. Like, this is basically what Paul Rudd would have looked like in Anchorman without the mustache. Yes. And uh, Lance, basically, I think, was like when Mark Hamill went, I got a pass on this movie. I just got this new sci-fi gig I'm shooting. <laughs> you were right. Let's 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 talk about Mark Hamill for a second. He read this script because I'm sure he got it. And he read the script and went, man, fuck Roger Ebert. No, he, <laughs> went, he looked at the script and went, I get hogtied in this one and like sexually assaulted. Yeah, I'm gonna take the Luke Skywalker gig. <laughs> I'd rather go make out with my sister. Hell yes. I say we do an awkward transition and start this film off with a little. Oh, that'd be a gas, man. I could watch Tusi. And now we can start the film. So this movie <laughs> opens with the screen crawl that this is not the sequel of Valley of the Dolls. This is a completely other movie that delves in so roger ebert couldn't even in his own in his own i i guess drug addled mind because this is very the drugs wrote this film but he couldn't even think of like his own concept and he was like let's do something that kind of is like yeah hollywood's bad and things and stuff and we'll just we'll kind of loosely make it and we'll just name it beyond the valley so people will actually watch it well, in fairness, they did. It was the original <laughs> script was a sequel, but turns out they lost one of their lead actresses, and they were like, "I guess we got to scrap this and go with something else." After the you know opening with the with the screen crawl, we get this ridiculous opening of the band, the Kelly Affair, and there are three women that don't know how to play their instruments. And they're playing at the Westmont Senior Prom. And I oh, I got to ask this, because anytime I see pictures from back then, and I know it's a thing now, and people on TikTok talk about it, and Twitter, and yada, yada. Why were kids, these kids are 18, 17, minimum 17, right, for Senior Prom. These bitches all look like they're 45. Every single one in the in the prom, they all look so goddamn old. Yeah, dude, that's what fucking eating red meat and having cigarettes and alcoholic parents will fucking do for you. This Listen, ha- look, man, the whole prettiness of the seventies. More people look like fucking Charlie Manson than they did Sharon Tate. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> you were correct. We Filthy also motherfuckers. See the- the band manager Harris, which the the best part about this, it's like okay, it looks like these these chicks are in a Robert Palmer video. And it's like simply irresistible, and they're just they're not playing for real. And you got Harris 
spinning like the wheel of fortune wheel mm-hmm. with the little with the little light behind it because you know that was the 70s um and they didn't have automation <laughs> so that, they couldn't they couldn't get the motor to make the wheel turn harris's journey reminded me a lot of my own because i once tried out for football and they were like here hold these flag sticks and just every <laughs> time they get a first down you march but you're part of the team Oh, uh, so I would be but, the spin the pinwheel guy and make uh, wink, make fanciful lights. Like if now, you, this, if I went out with because Armando has a band. If you don't know this, Armando has a band. So when like they go out and play, and I visit Armando, he makes me spin the pinwheel and do psychedelic right, lights when they play <laughs> Anagata de Vida. <laughs> but this. Harris is you, and here's why. So not only is he <laughs> is he the spin the colored wheel guy, he's also he's their band manager. And then mm-hmm. we they get the shot of the the whole band, all three of the girls in the van with Harris, and then him and the lead singer Kelly, they just start banging in the van in front of the other two as they yeah, this- smoke pot. I'm like, oh yeah, this is literally Corey's gig. Oh yeah, let's let's smoke a fucking J and like maybe fall into an orgy. I'm okay with that. This is where we would differ though. Um, if I was ever asked, thank God I don't fuck these type of women, but if I was ever asked, are you trying to make love to me? I'd say no, I'm trying to fuck. Let me in, I'm trying to fuck. It cuts to um, like with this quick cut into LA with this mm. weird voiceover. It's like LA, so weird, happy, and sunshine, and traffic. Love to walk. No culture. Groove, salon. Cold and cruel. Swimming pool. Phony city. Kelly goes to LA then to find her Aunt Susan, right? <laughs> and her aunt Susan has this large inheritance that she's trying to get her hands on, and apparently. Aunt Susan runs a porn studio. <laughs> they say she's in advertising, but when Kelly walks into this place, it's literally just naked bitches everywhere. Yeah, they're advertising for pornography. <laughs> it's like <laughs> that is uh, what they're doing. Yeah, it's uh this this whole lead up, and it's like, oh, the the aunt has the inheritance, and her mom should have gotten like half of it maybe but maybe she your aunt, but she disappears she just walks in she just walks in and goes <laughs> da, 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 da. i'm your niece and she's like dope here's a third of my money <laughs> yeah Thanks. and it's this is this is how you know it's a 70s movie too because they were like how much is the inheritance a million dollars and she was like sure you can have a third of it with a third of that you can buy a literal mansion in hollywood $250,000? Oh, my. I can retire. So and the lawyer somehow is the bad guy for going, what the fuck are you doing, yeah. you crazy and, bitch? This woman just walked in off the streets. You yeah. don't know her. So Porter, the lawyer, they're, <laughs> at, they're at dinner. Uh, Kelly asks for a third, or Susan offers a third, I think, of the million-dollar inheritance. That's, you know, Porter's already pissed off about it. He was like, Do we all we know is her name and she sort of looks like her mother. That's it. Can we get a birth certificate? Do you got a social security card? Do you have any proof that you are who you say you are? And by the way, it's not like her, her mom like just disappeared. They never said that she died, I don't think. She was just like, oh, it was a shame that your mom disappeared like that. Yeah, she fucking she. Her mom was Amelia Earhart, apparently. Like, so Susan then is like, "Oh, you're in a band? Awesome! That's so groovy." So she introduces Kelly to this rock producer named Ronnie Z-Man Barzell, who apparently loves like the Middle Ages, loves the '70s getups. And uh, he has the girls perform at one of his like groovy hip parties. And well, which, after he which, does the but, most accurate Hollywood thing, which is like, 
a new 17-year-old girl has been introduced to the party. Let me squire you about my castle, love. And then they just walk into random rooms with people fucking. They're looking yeah. at ferns. And he's like, I look at a fern and it reminds me of Lays a jungle. And it's like, that's what you see when you see a fucking fern, bro? That's crazy. That's what Harvey fucking won. talk. That's what Harvey Weinstein said too before he jerked off into the fern. So, yeah, me, <laughs> meanwhile, they're fucking they're fucking two feet behind him, and she keeps looking at that like you. You keep looking at this fern, like these people are banging back here. Like, should we right. like move on with our day? Um, no, this is basically what I'm assuming Usher went through at P Diddy's house oh, when he lived there. This for a was year. a P Diddy party for <laughs> sure. <laughs> After Susan introduces them, Z-Man wants the girls to perform, so they perform, and Z-Man then just automatically, like, takes over control of the band. Like, he's like, hey, Harris, oh. hold, th hold this for a second. And then, so he does the whole band thing, he produces them, he changes the band's name, and we then get a song performed in the studio with some awesome editing and camera shots. Dude, this, this was like, do you remember, is... do you, do you remember when you were a kid and you would take school pictures and yep, they'd be like, the, like, the, the one is like this. And then there was always like the shadow of you mm -hmm. <laughs> in the corner. Like that's what this shot was. Oh yeah. There's just passing facial transitions of fucking awkward grins as the women play. And oh then it's God. like, as things start to change, like it's only Harris watching. In the transition. <laughs> and then he fades out. And then it's Harris and Z-Man both. And then Z-Man fades back. It's like, dude. <sighs> yeah. I, I'm glad they learned how to montage by the time Scarface hit. Because this is shit. This and there is it. no real indication of a passage of time. Like, it goes from this to them all of a sudden performing, like, rock star fucking like yeah uh events like arena gigs like jim and the holograms and it's like where the <laughs> fuck how did this happen and this porn star is still fiending for harris and oh, again no. this, this is where star? harris and i completely diverge uh, because it's like oh you're gonna cuck me cuck you kelly watch this and yeah, I'm just because... raw dog and porn stars the rest well, of the time on <laughs> Kelly's dime. <laughs> Hell yes. It's odd to me because she finally gets him here after a little bit in the in the Bentley, right? No, the it's... rolls. Oh, the rolls. Nothing beats a rolls. Were that's, you even watching this? Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Have you even fucked a porn star? What the fuck are you doing? Nothing's the rolls here. There's nothing like a roll. Not even a Bentley. Not even a Bentley. She fucks him in the rolls, right? And he mm -hmm. seems into it. And then all of a sudden, it's like the next time we see them, they're on the beach and she's trying to bang. And he's like, can we just bang in a bed? And I don't want to bang anymore. And then she calls him gay and leaves. I was like, I'm pretty sure after, after you hit it that first time, and she's like, Awesome, let's do that again. You just you, you just do it. You're yeah, there well, now, guy. Corey's life lessons. Hi, ladies, including porn stars, Uncle Corey here. Just because you are a feminine fuckboy is into butt stuff doesn't necessarily mean he's gay. It could just be you're overused pussy. <laughs> Is it possible this story is true? Yes, it is. After a gig that they have, Harris gets mad because he feels like he's getting pushed out. He doesn't want to go to Z-Man's party. And this is where Kelly meets Lance, who gives off this super creepy vibe. I don't care if it's the 70s, the 90s, or the 2000s. This vibe is, this is a hanger-on who's creepy as fuck. Don't do that, it's not good for you. Hi, Kellys of the world. Um, so you meet this guy, right? You're you're in a band and like you're starting to perform, you're starting to get big, Z-Man's got your back, and everything's groovy, right? 
And you also have an aunt who is about to give you a third of her million dollar inheritance. You bang the dude once, and then the next morning he wakes up. First of all, you've already told him that, that you have this third of a million dollars coming to you? Because he wakes up the next day and he was like, it should be half, it shouldn't be a third. The minute the dude starts talking to you like this, get this dude some cab fare and get him the fuck out of Dodge. Just throwing it out there. Hi, Armando's Uncle Corey here. <laughs> Why are you blowing up my spot, motherfucker? <laughs> what I do to you? <laughs> Jesus. Some of us got some of us are trying to eat too, bro. You were right. We get scenes of Petronella and her new law student dude, Emerson, banging in the straw. And Porter. Which ugh. don't yeah, do that. Don't, don't, yeah, don't bang in straw. Like that's not even a PSA. Just don't don't bang in hay. <laughs> yeah. Whoever's on the bottom is getting the fuzzy end of that lollipop. Yeah. Okay. The, don't bang in hay or on sand. Like both of those are awful. Yeah, so, they at least lay a blanket the, down when when she's trying to bang the gay out of him. Yeah. But <laughs> the the hay thing that's a that's a lot. Porter here, the lawyer, tries to buy Kelly off right with fifty grand in cash. Even though now, to, because of Lance, she's asking for half a million dollars. Porter's like, I think I could totally buy her off with 50 grand in cash up front just to like go away and stop asking. So she takes him back to her place, gets him high, and then like jerks him off. Like, I don't get what happened here. I have no fucking idea the point of this, the purpose of I thought it was going to be like, Look at these young nubile titties. Yes. Let's let's work together to get all of Susan's money. Yeah, something. Nope. It was just like I'm a fucking crazy sex addict pill popper now and I'm going <laughs> to I like to jerk off rando old men who are trying to fuck me out of money. <laughs> Tits. Hoo-ah! We have porn star Ashley here who dumps Harris then Harris loses his shit when he sees Kelly and Lance in Z-Man's house all over each other. And Harris and his sandals get the shit kicked out of him. Like, it's bad. And my favorite part, because apparently in all these movies back in the day, like you had to have the champ. You had to have a boxer who had just won like the heavyweight title in all your movies. But... Him running, like, this is like a coked up boxer because he's running around. He's like, get up. It's time to fight. There you go. Come on. Come on. Get up. Right up. Come on. There you go. Come on, man. Come on. What are you the missing? outcome is inevitable. A golden gladiator must emerge victorious. Bro, I know everybody gets a little fucked up and they think they're tougher than they are, but the shit Harris is on should not be making him want to fight. He seems like he's on all downers. Like, yeah. he should have been like, I'm going to fuck you up. But he's, like, talking to, like, a suit of armor in the corner that Z-Man has. Like, not a real person. This made, this just shouldn't have happened, ever. Yeah. No, he's, there, there are a lot of downers. Both literally, like, the actual pills. <laughs> and in the writing, there are a lot of downers in this fucking movie. Yeah, but, dude. And this is like, for some reason, this is what shakes Kelly loose. Is yeah. like, she sees Lance get violent and all of a sudden she's like, oh my God, I've loved Harris this whole time. And I've said it before and I'll say it again. When you get beat up by the girl's new boyfriend, that's not how it really goes. Yes. They always walk away with the new guy. Yes. Never with the bloody stump of a fucking pussy that's left on the ground. <laughs> oh, <God. laughs> Me. Hi. So Kelly here smacks the shit out of Porter. Aunt Susan finds out that Porter went behind her back with the whole 50 grand thing. 
Petronella is upset with the happenings and her and the heavyweight champ go back to her place and bang. And she, that's, she says, that, I cry. And he says, I fuck. And then they yeah. just go do it. A hundred percent. And then Emerson walks in, he comes home unexpectedly and the champ runs Emerson down with his car and takes off. Now, can what's we talk in about, the fucking Charlottesville is happening can, here? Can, can we talk about two scenes? There isn't a, I'm sorry. It's not what it looks like. She goes, you were supposed to be studying. You were supposed to be. St-. She just keeps repeating that over and over again. He was like, yeah, bitch, I got it. I was supposed to be studying. You're, you're banging the heavyweight champ. Hey champ, what's going on guy? <laughs> like, okay. That's one. And then two, <laughs> what the fuck is the champ doing? He loses his ever loving fucking mind when he's trying to re- like Emerson leaves, like I'm angry. And then he just goes and stands in front like he's Superman in front of the car. And the champ just fucking goes ballistic. Apparently the champ's doing coke all the time. <laughs> Son of a bitch, get the hell out of there. You either move your ass boy or I'll move it for you. Dude, this is a mess. First off, the truly oil. You can eat a dick. Another one, apparently. Because blaming him because he was supposed to be studying? Yeah, to be a lawyer so he can get everyone out of this crazy bullshit you are all wrapped up in. Yes. His life is trash. This is the one guy who's actually, like, decent and hasn't fallen prey to the bullshit. And you're like, you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to go fuck a guy who he can't possibly beat up when he catches me. This is the yeah. coldest that like, that's my fucking nightmare is walking in to a guy. It's just like, I can't, I can't even beat you. Like, I guess I'll just go. This is such a crock of shit. So Harris here then goes to Casey's house, the bass player to talk. Casey whips out some downers. Cause of course she does. And they both get fucked up. They go to sleep together that night. And after Casey wakes up next to Harris the next morning, she goes ape shit and accuses Harris of raping her. Dude, she said, like, There's... you're like all the rest of them when she woke yes. up. Yeah, yeah, so yeah. So it seems to me that she gets so pilled out, she doesn't remember what's happening and then wakes up the next morning next to somebody and is like, oh, shit. Well, I'm so... just going to, I'm going to throw this out here. As an audience member, like when you're writing a movie or a book or something, right? And some a situation like this happens. The chick wakes up, she's ape shit and grr. the audience should have some sort of idea of what happened the night before. It's lit again, non sequiturs. It's like boop, dip, boop, you're you rape me. And I'm looking at it like did I, did I miss, like, should I rewind that? Like, did that actually happen? Because yeah, it sounded also, like he was crying and then they went to bed. He was, so. She basically, Casey tells Harris, because Harris goes over to Casey's house to confide in her that this porn star just told him he was gay. Yes. And he thinks he might actually be. Yes. So he goes to confide in his friend. So while she's a lesbian and it's like, well, I don't know, he's gay. Why would he? You know what I mean? Like, if that's the way it's going to be, but that story also goes away because he gets his feet back and he's like, guess what? I'm not paralyzed and I'm straight. Lucky me for having this this new fight. Talk about tying a bow on the whole fucking thing. Because after this, she loses her shit. He goes to like some... TV show that they're taping some interview show. He tries Mm. to commit suicide from by jumping off the rafters and like breaking his neck. And they're like, Oh, he, he could. I love how the doctor was just like, he's paralyzed, but like he, did they say he's a quadriplegic or he was a pair. He's a paraplegic. So he's a paraplegic, but in some circumstances it could possibly be a thing that he could start walking again and i'm like oh just in how the way this is written i'm like so he's gonna walk again right you were correct and then casey reveals that it's her she's pregnant and it's 
Harris's kid. So now she was going to get an abortion, but now she doesn't want to because she feels bad because Harris is a paraplegic. And apparently Roger Ebert is viciously pro-choice. Or I'm sorry, yes. viciously pro-life. Pro yes. Because there's a whole monologue here about how Casey was raped, but she shouldn't, she knows she shouldn't feel any sort of love or uh, uh, need to give Harris what he wants. But also, she does. Because now she has a son growing inside of her and she wants to give Harris this child. And I'm sitting here thinking the whole time, how do you know it's his? Again, yes. because of the editing, like you were saying, it goes from, hi, I think I'm gay, to, you raped me, with zero comfort. He looks just as confused as she, like, I did yep. what? What are you talking about? To the next thing. And Harris also says, or asks if he can sleep with her. Yeah. Not like fucker. But, like, can we sleep together? Like, he just wants to sleep in the same bed. So when they wake up together in the same bed, naked, because everyone in this movie sleeps naked. Yes. She just naturally assumes, and, he, like, he's all the rest of them, and you took advantage of me, and da-da-da-da. And then she's pregnant, and she's like, it's Harris's. I'm like, says who? <laughs> Exactly. You've had this happen to you so many times that you just naturally wake up next to a guy who you forget confess that he might be gay. So now you're pregnant. You're just like, it's his. Why? Because he's a quadriplegic now. Okay. <laughs> sure. Makes total sense. Uh, but then, so we get this like weird scene when the champ goes back to Pet and Emerson's place and he basically says he's going to rape Pet and he and Emerson fight until she threatens to cut him up. And then he's like, and then we get like the weird joke. He's like, I don't have a cut man. So I'm a fucking out of this bitch. <laughs> and he just leaves cut to the next scene. And here I am without a good cut man in my corner. I sure could use old Dan Floyo right now. Cause without the cut man, I, I might get a little slice under the eye. Don't mean anything. And, and that whole storyline's done. All the way done. Yeah. Kelly is now taking care of Harris in a wheelchair. And we cut to this special like clockwork orange Nazi party that Z-Man is holding at his, at his house where it's like Casey, Casey's girlfriend, Roxanne and Lance. And he dresses them all up in like superhero costumes and they have to stay in character and apparently also have to take a massive amount of drugs because, you know, it's Seaman's house. And this is the weird part is like this written in thing that Martin Borman, a high end, a high level Nazi, may have been the bartender at Z-Man's, and so they dress him up in a Nazi uniform, and then they tell him to fuck off after, like, two minutes. <laughs> but then he just sticks around in the Nazi uniform. Yeah, and he makes he comments to the champ. It. He's like, oh, we could have used you on the, on the Russian front. It's like, that means you were fighting for the... Is, <laughs> where is this coming from? Why the fuck is Martin Borman a character in this movie and a bartender in Hollywood? Like, it makes no sense. What the fuck is happening? And I have to ask the question again, Roger Ebert, where do you get the fucking balls to judge people's movies? Hell yes. At least we're here to make people laugh. Like there's there's no seriousness to that. Like it's, everything's honk honk, tongue in cheek, whatever. Roger Ebert got some serious problems. You know why? Roger Ebert and Hitler are very similar in this regard, okay? Hitler painted one painting at 16 and was like, we're not letting you into this school. And he was like, I'm killing all the Jews. And then Roger Ebert wrote this piece of shit movie and everybody else was like, you're never writing anything again. He's like, I'm destroying every movie known to man. That's his whole career. Dude, for real. This is like, 
This is honestly like Dave Mays owning the Source magazine and judging hip hop. Okay. Where the <laughs> fuck do you get off? But at the end of this party, dude, they all go to their separate rooms. Casey and Roxanne bang. Z-Man tries to like jerk Lance off, make out with him. Lance refuses. So Z-Man decides to just wait till he falls asleep or pass out. And he hog ties Lance. He threatens him with a sword. And then finally, Z-Man unbuttons his shirt and reveals his breasts to the world. And Lance laughs at him and calls him like an ugly broad. Which so so Z Man not decapitates only, him. He fucking decapitates him. Not only are you an ugly broad, those are the worst titties I have ever seen in my life. Come on, practical effects. Practical effects back then weren't great, dude. That was horrible. And again, like we said, like Roger Ebert's pro life, he's also very anti trans. Because if I'm like, I'm thinking of, I think, I think I'm a woman inside. I'm thinking about transitioning and making this step. And I see this movie and I'm like, that's what my titties are going to look like. (laughs) Fuck that shit. No fucking way. I'd rather live in denial and in pain the rest of my life. Yes. Those, those were disgusting. (laughs) They were not awesome. They were not awesome. But we get Casey and Sergeant Schultz here who see the whole decapitation murder thing and they run away. Z-Man chases down and kills Schultz on the beach. He goes into the house. He grabs a gun. He goes into Roxanne's room where she's quietly sleeping. Has no idea of what's going on. He's like, cool. Puts a gun in her mouth, blows her head off. Casey calls Kelly for help. Not the cops. She calls Kelly for help. So Kelly and the Scooby-Doo gang go to Z-Man's house. Z-Man finds Casey. He shoots her. The gang gets there. They jump in to action here. A scuffle ensues. Pet gets shot. And then they shoot Z-Man and kill him here. And this is where I'm like, watching them get into the car and having to wait for Harris in the wheelchair. I'm like, was this oh, supposed so this to be a comedic- prequel to this is the prequel to Texas Chainsaw Massacre? I totally get it. Like he's just going to stay in the wheelchair and eat and get fat and depressed, and they're going to all go to some fucking rock concert or some shit across Texas and blammo, yep. all over. I'm with it. I'm, I'm more into the movie at this point, and yeah, I mean. Again, it's not really a PSA because if you do this, you kind of deserve what's coming to you. But when you need to call a cop, don't call your friend and tell them to call the cop. Because if you can get through to your friend, you can probably get through to the cop. Yes. Unless you live in an aggressively black neighborhood, then we all know the cops are never coming and 911 will permanently keep you on hold. Yes. Or if you live in a very rich neighborhood in Hollywood like this one. So maybe she does have to call Kelly because. They were like, where? You're at P. Diddy's house. We can't get there. So they just kind of let the shit slide. But the best. Well, no, what happened? What happens in Hollywood is they show up and what they would have done is drop the black glove on the ground and went like, I think the heavyweight champ was here. (laughs) Yes. He's been running people over all over town. We should just get him for murder. The best part of this movie is like, I I just went, fuck it, of course. like. Again, talk about pretty bows tied at the end of the movie. Like after the scuffle, and by the way, they're all scuffling, right? Harris is confined to his wheelchair. Like he falls out and then he just covers up. Like Mm -hmm. that's where, that's where he's at. He was like, he's not even swinging. He's not grabbing for anything. He's just covering his vitals, right? We're, we're, we're back to Corey and Harris being the same person. Cause that's exactly how I fight. I just fucking. And then after Z-Man gets shot, he starts wiggling his toes and now he's just able to walk again. So four, four cool. or five people had to die. So Harris could walk again. That's what it's, that's the cost. Like, so if you have a disabled family member, kill five people and God will let them walk again. Absolutely. And then we get this voiceover life lesson with the summary of the movie. 
as Kelly and Harris drive their Corvette to some field so they can go for a walk. And the movie ends as everyone that's left alive gets married. That's the, that's the ending to this. By the way, if you're interested in this movie, it's for rent on Amazon. I rented it on Amazon. Um, all you have to do is watch this last four minutes with the voiceover. It's the cliff notes of the fucking movie. Yeah. They just give you a summary and then it ends with a wedding. Watch the four minute short and save yourself the hour 48. Yes. Basically, if you want to survive, according to Roger Ebert, be a straight person who has a very tumultuous relationship with everybody they end up marrying. Like you're up, yes. you're down, there are proposals, there are cheatings, there are randomly jerking off old men for no reason. And then you get married at the end and that's how you survive in Hollywood. I like the random jerking off of old men with mm -hmm. the fucking, with the sock holders and, and the actual boxer shorts, like, you know, cause boxer, it was either see, that's the shitty thing about the seventies. There's, there's a lot of shitty things about the seventies, but this is the one main shitty thing for guys. You had two choices, tidy whities or boxer shorts. Neither one of those choices are very good. Nope. Because tidy whities ridiculous. Boxer shorts, also ridiculous. And those were, at that time, those were considered just for old men. But also, I, I went through a boxer short. I tried to do the boxer short thing, like when I was in high school. Mm -hmm. I, my ass crack was constantly wet. I just, I couldn't do it. I, I just, not for me. Like. I need some, I need some support. Like, and then you're just, your, your bits are just out and just jiggling all day. Not for me. And I don't know why older guys love those. Yeah. Because I don't, I, their shit's hanging. I haven't worn any sort of underwear since like 2012. So I don't fucking know. You're like a 1990s fucking porn star. Oh, dude, you I'm just, just constantly hanging you dong. Just, you just you just take your jeans off and there's just no underwear. I used to nope. think watching those movies back in like the 90s, I'd be like, who are these fucking crazy people, psychos just walking around just with jeans, just raw dog in it. And it's apparently like that was you. Me, Mel Gibson, Jean-Claude Van Damme. <laughs> no, Van Damme goes with the briefs. You know, That's he's got true. the briefs. He'll, he'll drop some bikini briefs on that ass. Yeah. But yeah. No, I mean, outside of that, dude, like, God damn, the 70s were fucking wild. Like, you could just put anything out in the theaters. Yeah, this, I don't even know if I can say this is a bad movie because I have zero context for what the fuck I even watched. I can it say it doesn't so hold over. up, but I will say this is the one compliment I will give this movie above anything else. I'm listening. I'm trying to think of one. <laughs> now, they they really did kind of cover all of the archetypes that have become cliches for a uh, uh, I'm new to Hollywood story. Yeah. Right? You got the pills. You got the sex. And you got this happening. This guy's going over here. And everybody's getting used up by all of these different kinds of characters. That I could appreciate. The execution, not great. The, the editing in this is goddamn awful. Yes. And it doesn't even allow you to be like, well, I don't know if this is a director thing. I don't know if this is a script thing, if it's a stu. I don't know what this is. All I know is, if you are going to give me an NC-17 movie, you supply dick. And if you don't supply dick in an NC-17 movie, you can get the fuck out of my house. Hell yes. That's where I want to end up. Oh, for Corey, I'm Armando. This is Kiss the Reviews, and this was 1970s Beyond the Valley of the Dolls.